The question of whether God of War Ragnarok is a good game is a stupid one. Of course it is. Had Santa Monica Studio just given God of War 2018 a new coat of paint, injected Atreus with some steroids, and shipped it as a final release, it would have still been a good game. So the question then becomes, is God of War Ragnarok a good sequel? Well, that question is a lot more complicated. With how monumental God of War 2018 was, Santa Monica had the colossal task of delivering a sequel which not only matched the weight and spectacle of its predecessor, but advanced it in almost every single way. In order to figure out whether they succeeded or not, we need to take a fresh look back at God of War 2018 and discuss what made it the prodigious title that it was. Coming off the heels of the incredibly successful original trilogy, Santa Monica decided to rewrite and reimagine one of gaming's most prolific icons, turning him from the egregiously violent god killer into a solemn father. This change was an incredibly successful one, giving the character a third dimension and allowing the players a closer, more uncomfortable look into the mind of Kratos. Along with his son Atreus, they travel the realms of Norse mythology to spread Kratos' wife and Atreus' mother's ashes. Their arduous journey culminated with Atreus finding out that he was a half-giant named Loki, and Kratos finding out that he was destined to die at Ragnarok, of which they had just set in motion by killing Baldur. The story of God of War 2018 was definitely one of its strongest aspects. Watching the growth and development of Kratos and Atreus' relationship, from distant mentor to loving father, was incredibly poignant. While they were glamorized, by killing literal gods, wielding magic axes and bows with superhuman strength, they were grounded by their mistakes. Kratos found it difficult to connect and understand his son. Atreus lacked control of his emotions and outbursts. This made the story relatable and allowed the players to connect to the characters as more than just gods. That's not to say that the combat was grounded, because it was often in its excessiveness that it was the most fun. You toppled giants, gods, and dragons, brutally executing them just as you would in the previous games, but with a newfound weight as a result of Kratos attempting to teach his son to not become violent just as he did. Combat was swift and punchy, enemies would go flying into the air, and each attack connected with a dynamic thud which never lost its effect. The game was able to find a nice balance between combat and story, weaving them together effortlessly to never bore the player. This leads into one of God of War's most impressive aspects. Throughout the entire game, the camera never leaves their journey. There are no loading screens to break up the flow of combat or story, apart from when the player dies, which only adds more incentive to fight well. While this isn't necessarily groundbreaking technology, for a game as technically stunning and with such vibrant and varied locales, it's a wonder how Santa Monica were able to get this to work on a base PS4 hardware. However, not everything in God of War 2018 was successful. This comes down to more subjective tastes, but personally, I really wasn't a huge fan of the tact on RPG mechanics. I don't want to have to loot 15 chests only to upgrade my armor set into something uglier to give me a slightly higher luck stat. Not only does this make such an inconsequential impact on gameplay, it actually interrupts the flow, leading to a lot of time when neither the story nor the combat is advanced. The skill trees are definitely better, giving actual helpful improvements to combat throughout the game for both Kratos and Atreus, which also reflects their growth in the story. But the armor system, not a huge fan. Another aspect which I and many other players didn't like was the backtracking in the game. At one point, they asked the player to basically retrace all of their steps. This wasn't a massive problem, as it gave more time for Kratos and Atreus to interact, but more broadly, this added another 5 hours to the game. The main game is around 20 hours, which isn't a huge time investment, but when a quarter of that time is spent exploring Midgard, again, then it becomes noticeable especially on return playthroughs. None of these problems are major, and compared to the height that the game reaches, these lows aren't very low but they are important to mention when discussing the sequel. Ideally, Santa Monica would have learnt from their small mistakes and fixed them, and made what was already brilliant even more refined. So, with that all out of the way, let's finally take a look at God of War Ragnarok. From the get-go, 
Ragnarok makes it clear that this isn't just God of War 2018 1.5. The relationship between Atreus and Kratos isn't just the same as it was at the end of the previous game. Time has passed, they have both grown, one of them physically, but mostly in their trust and care for each other. No longer is Kratos hesitant to comfort Atreus, and similarly, no longer is Atreus reliant on Kratos' every word. He takes initiative, acts of his own volition, for better and for worse. Their relationship now actually reflects that of a caring father and an obedient but often impulsive son still learning his place in the world. Kratos scolds Atreus for swearing. Atreus retorts with jokes about his father being old. This human interaction is contrasted against their godly actions to create even more empathy and love for these incredibly deep characters. While the world is the same one as before, it's also very different. Fimble Winter has set in, impacting the landscape and the enemies themselves. Not only this, but the actions of 20 2018 are referenced, and have had an actual impact on the world itself. Atreus talks about the events that happen in certain locations, and we see the consequences of our previous actions impacting the world itself. This is all framed through Ragnarok's biggest addition from the previous game, shifting perspectives. No longer does the ever-present camera just follow Kratos. You are instead given time alone with Atreus. Or maybe he'll be with Sindri. Or maybe he'll be with Angrabodar. This all changes the lens the player is viewing the world through. Atreus's optimism and caring nature will lead him to pointing out certain aspects of the world that Kratos would completely ignore through his nihilism. And of course, this is also the biggest change gameplay has seen through the sequel, and it's an immensely impactful one. The moment I first gained control of Atreus was magical. Being able to experience the world through Atreus' eyes, his emotions, his thoughts, was powerful to say the least. Not only this, but to be able to gain control of him in combat was exhilarating. His combat style differs greatly from Kratos, without it feeling weak or unintuitive in comparison. Playing as Atreus was a treat, and helped to reduce the repetition of combat following on from the previous game. Had it been relatively unchanged, then fighting as Kratos would have been tedious. But with Atreus' inclusion, that makes that problem non-existent, and I couldn't be happier for it. He fights with his bow, shooting arrows, and able to use it up close as well. Throughout the game, his arsenal increases, creating more options for varied combat. This isn't just a simple addition to justify the sequel status of the game. This was a deliberate, well-executed evolution of the first game's combat that just works effortlessly. Other, more subtle quality of life changes to combat have also been added. Firstly, the inclusion of more verticality in both the arenas and in Kratos' and Atreus' movesets allow for more options to brutally murder the enemies. Secondly, more interactions between the god that you control and their sidekick allow for more skillful focus during the fights, rather than just simply mashing R1. These additions allow for combat to feel similar and therefore still feel intuitive for returning players, while still allowing for growth in their fighting styles. Story-wise, the focus revolves around the ending of 2018. Both Kratos and Atreus know that Ragnarok is coming, and they know that everything they hold dear is in danger. However, either through denial or ignorance, Kratos chooses to not believe the prophecy, including the one of his death, leading to Atreus taking action into his own hands in order to save his father and the Nine Realms. This story has much greater stakes than the previous game, with basically the whole world on the line. However, this is where the game poses its first weakness in comparison to the predecessor. While in the story the stakes are much, much higher, this creates a disconnect with the gameplay. Constantly, the pair are thrown optional side missions which, obviously in comparison, are less important than saving the world. However, they will often remark that they have time that should help other residences of the Nine Realms in an attempt to engage the player in more optional activities. It's almost as if they've forgotten that the whole world is at stake, but no, let's go help this woman save her cat or something. This creates every gaming YouTuber's favourite words, ludonarrative Ludo dissonance, dissonance, as the urgency of the story is heavily detached from the flow of gameplay. The main story is fantastic as expected, with growing tension, conflict, satisfying revolutions and huge poignant moments, but all tension is dissipated whenever Atreus tells me to explore some mines which have nothing to do with Ragnarok. Sadly, this isn't the only place where I think the sequel falters. The tax on RPG mechanics from the first game make their return, but now with even more superfluous items and stats which require more sifting through menus. This completely slows down the flow of combat and story even further at times to a grinding halt, just so you can spend your currency, which you spent half the main quest hunting for in chests, to increase one stat by a minuscule amount by adding an even uglier piece of armor. Just 
Leave RPG mechanics in RPGs, please. And not only this, but all the skills you unlocked in the previous game have been reset, leaving Kratos back where he was at the beginning of God of War 2018. This means you have to re-unlock all of his skills and abilities, just to finally get him back to where he was at the end of the last game, with a few minor upgrades. Well, this is barring one major inclusion, but that's something you should experience for yourself. This isn't to say that Ragnarok doesn't fix any issues from the first game. Backtracking is left to a minimum, and instead, you now have the option to explore all nine realms. Each realm varies drastically in look, traversal mechanics, and combat encounters, keeping the game feeling fresh throughout its 25 hours or so. Furthermore, more focus is placed on Norse mythology, with Kratos and Atreus being able to pick up collectibles along the way, which give more insight into the fascinating lore of the world. Of course, Mimir is still giving more interesting lore along the journey, but given that for large portions of the game he isn't present as you play as Atreus, these are good substitutes which can act as an actual incentive to explore, other than just stat upgrades. Ragnarok, while still being built from the DNA of his predecessor, feels fresh and exciting. That comes due in part to their change of leadership. At Santa Monica Studio, they opt to change director of each God of War game, in order to give it a fresh set of eyes and direction to reduce the chance of a repetitive sequel. The success of this approach can be felt clearly in every part of the game, and its effectiveness I imagine will lead to this being incorporated into more studios in the future. The level of detail that went into Ragnarok is pretty outstanding. Of course, this is a result of the huge pressure that the previous game put on Santa Monica. They had to one-up themselves, they had to somehow surpass a masterpiece. This led to the game being developed with a magnifying glass, and it really pays off. Small details, such as Atreus mimicking Kratos' actions when helping people, is very satisfying to watch. Every inch of the world feels purposeful. Every puzzle feels good to overcome whilst not being too difficult to require a Google search. What makes it all the more impressive is how this was all done through the COVID pandemic. Santa Monica had to overcome the challenges of working at home, with certain aspects such as motion capture having to be done under COVID restrictions, yet they still look fantastic. The entire team has to be applauded for their ability to put out a fully finished, polished AAA release under such difficult restrictions. It's clear that Ragnarok was made with passion. The constant references to not only 2018, but the original trilogy greatly adds to the immersion of the experience. We aren't just playing the sequel to God of War 2018, but the next blockbuster in a masterpiece of a series. This is enabled by the fact that the same team behind the games has stayed consistent throughout, and this has led to the best developers for the series to be in one place working together with a complete and singular vision. We have seen where changing developers has impacted the series many times, and the dedication on the part of Santa Monica to stay with this series and to continue to iterate and evolve the formula is impressive to say the least. God of War Ragnarok isn't just a good game. It's a perfect example of how to develop a sequel. It builds and evolves on the existing formula, adds interesting ideas, and wears its predecessors proudly on its shoulder. While in some ways it falters against the weight of the masterpiece that is God of War 2018, it's nothing in comparison to the inventive additions to gameplay that rejuvenate and reduce the effect of monotony. Santa Monica Studio have developed something special here, and it's thanks purely to their hard work and dedication through tough times and impossible standards that they have set themselves. God of War Ragnarok should be a shining example on how to develop a sequel, and I can't wait to see where they take the series next after the Norse duology. Thanks for watching.